Good morning. So glad that you could join us for our online resources. And so we continue to do this each week uh, as a way for those that can't be here on Sunday morning as we're gathering outside. And so uh, so glad you could join us this morning as we continue to spend time in Romans chapter four together. But let me pray for us and then we're gonna jump in this morning. God, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to spend time in your word. Uh, we thank you for what you teach us, what you show us about who you are and who we are in light uh, of the way you've created us to be, the way you've redeemed us. We pray that as we spend time in your word and we consider just what you tell us uh, about how to grow in faith and how to trust you more and the benefits of that and what that looks like, I pray that you would lead and guide us, that you would teach us, that you would show us, that you would uh, continue uh, to open our hearts and minds to see you more fully. Uh, I pray that you would move uh, as, as these words are spoken, that the Holy Spirit would come and that you would guide us in all truth, that you would take the eternal truths of your word and apply them to our hearts and our minds, that you would give us understanding. And uh, we pray that we would see you more clearly and we would love you all the more because of it. Uh, we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, I know for many uh, this week, uh, kids back in school, kind of a strange time as we're navigating what that looks like. Uh, here in Dawson County, anyway, kids started. I know Forsyth is starting this week, and a lot of people wrestling with what that looks like and what that means. And so, uh, you know, the other night, Joanna and I, my wife, were, were sitting there, and she showed me a video of a pediatrician that somebody had asked their advice on what they thought about school. And uh, I love the simplicity of, of what this lady said and the, the way she said it. Uh, but in the video, they were asking her, you know, as you think about sending your kids back to school or keeping it home or how you're going to do that. Uh, what advice would she give? And, and she says, uh, the decision that you make about school is the right decision. She said, that's it, that's, that's my advice. And some people won't like it. And, and she would go on to say that uh, you need to understand uh, that, that as you make this decision, uh, it, it's overwhelming and it's big and there's a lot to consider and all the things that are going on. And she said, and it feels like it's the most important decision in your mind, but it really isn't. It's only because you can't see what the future holds for the choice you're making that it makes you feel afraid. And so no decision is perfect and none of it will perfectly take everything into account. And so she just said, uh, we never have the answer for what the future holds. And so uh, make that decision and then kind of go with it. And, and so I was, I was re watching this video thinking about it. And as Joanne and I watched it, I said, yeah, she's starting to get to the beliefs underneath our beliefs, the way we see things and the way we operate and what it is that we're putting our faith and trust in. And she hit on a really important truth and just that short thing of, of make this decision and go with it and you don't know what the future holds. And, and the important truth there is that this idea that we have control over what's happening in the world is an illusion. None of us have control over what's happening. None of us has complete control over everything that's happening around us. Every single one of us is operating by faith to some degree or another. And as I was thinking about just that video and what she said and, and how we deal with the things that come at us in our life and the ways that we respond and what that looks like, uh, the truth is we're all putting our faith in something. And, and that's true of every single person, whether you uh, profess to be a Christian or you uh, profess to be an atheist or an agnostic or whatever it is, every single one of us is dealing with things that are outside of our control and we're having to take steps of faith, faith in something each and every day. And so as we think about Romans and this letter that we're walking through, you know, last week we looked at Paul turning and pointing us to Abraham and how God has saved Abraham through his faith. As we look at the Old Testament and what was God, God was doing in the Old Testament, and we considered Abraham and his faith. And, and one of the things that we talked about last week is that saving faith of truly putting our faith in God is transferring our trust from ourselves to God. And that's what saving faith looks like. Is our trust in ourself or have we put it in God and what he's done for us in Christ? And so each and every day we have the opportunity to grow in that faith, to grow in our trust uh, of putting it in God and who he is or, or taking it back and putting it in ourselves and then struggling with the ramifications of that. I think that's even what this pediatrician's advice was kind of based on. That oftentimes we fall into thinking that we're in control and we have control over things and it leads us to fear and struggle and all sorts of issues. And so her advice there of, of just make that decision. You don't know what the future holds. She's right. 
That is true. We don't know exactly what the future holds. But what scripture tells us and what Paul's reminding us of in Romans is that we do know the one who holds the future. And so when we're looking at these things and we're wrestling with them, how do we continue to grow in our faith? How do we continue to completely place our trust in who God is rather than our own understanding? And so I want us to think about that uh, this morning as we look at the second half of Romans chapter 4. We're working our way through this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And he's focusing us in on Abraham and Abraham's faith. And as we look at how God saved Abraham through faith. But then he says this real important thing in, in the middle of it. And this is kind of what I want us to focus on this morning. In, in chapter 4, in verse 20 and 21. It says, uh, no unbelief made him, talking about Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And so I want us just to think about how he grows in his faith, how he continues to take the trust from himself and transfer that trust to who God is and what he's done. And I also want us to consider why that's so very important. Not only that he does it and how we grow in it, but why it's so important for us. You know, God calls us into this relationship with him. And it's a relationship that's based on him being our creator and our redeemer, him doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We say that each and every week. And I was thinking about uh, the way that John Piper says it. If you don't know John Piper, he's been a pastor for many, many years in Minnesota. He's written a lot of wonderful books, an excellent scholar and, and, and pastor. But Piper has this statement that's kind of stood over his ministry for the whole of it, this past 50 years. And, and Piper says it this way, that God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. And then he goes on to say that when we're most satisfied in who God is and we're placing our trust in him and we're growing in that, that is where our greatest joy and contentment and rest will be found. And God is glorified when we're resting in who he is. And really that's a wonderful summary of us. We continue to transfer our trust from ourselves to who God is and what he's done. And I want us to ask the question as we look at Romans 4 this morning, how do we grow in that? How do we grow in our faith, especially in light of circumstances and things that press in and the things that we struggle with? How do we continue to grow? And so the way I want us to look at it this morning is, is real simple. First, I want us to consider uh, where is our focus? What is it that we're focusing on? Secondly, how do you process what you're going through? The things that come at us each and every day, how do we take those and, and process what's happening and continue to place our trust in God and who he is rather than ourselves? And then lastly, what's the key to all of this, right? So where is our focus? How do we process what's going on? And then what is the key to all of it? And so let's just start there with where our focus is. If you want to look with me, Romans chapter 4, I'm going to read 13 to 16 here to begin with. For the promise to Abraham and his offsprings that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the inherent adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, and not only to the inherit of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And so I'm going to stop there for just a second. And Paul's reminding us that it's all by faith through grace. He's been saying this throughout. He spent a long time in the first couple of chapters of pointing us to that we can never save ourselves by what we do. It must be uh, through faith in what Christ has done for us. It is the only way that we're made righteous. And he's saying that over and over and he's reminding that here again. But, but what I want you to just focus in on for just a second is he talks about uh, how there's this future and past and present, all of it, the fullness of it in this promise to Abraham. He's pointing back to the way God made this promise to Abraham, but how the fullness of it comes and how all those that are descendants of Abraham come into this promise that God made. And it's through the righteousness of faith. It's not by what you do or keeping the law. You can't do that. It's all what Christ would do for you. 
But here's the thing that I want us to consider first and foremost, and it's this, that when you see that it's to this future part, that there's, there's this function of the past events of what Christ has done. But when we start to look at our faith and we're transferring our faith, our faith also points us to the glorious future that we have in Jesus. And so when we think about where is our focus, there is a past, present, and future element of what Christ has done. And so often, I think what happens is we just focus on one part of that. Oftentimes, what we do is we just pat, focus on the past and what Christ has done. And so we look at the cross, and, and rightfully so, because that holds all these promises together. That is the purchase of those promises and what God has done in history. But we forget how God is, is working that out right now, today, presently in our lives, but also the future of what is to come by what he's doing. And so when I think about where is our focus, there has to be an eternal perspective that's seeing all of what God's doing and not just focusing on one part of it. And so what often happens, so I see this so frequently in our Christian walk, is, is people will talk about Jesus and their relationship with him and what he's done in just in past tense. Yes, God saved me and I put my faith in him and I walked down the aisle and I said a prayer and I did these things and they talk about it and yes, God saved me. But then day to day in their function, they're not letting it come to bear on where they are right now and they're forgetting that the future that they're worried about and wrestling with and struggling with, you know, go back to the thing, uh, thing about sending your kids to school, right? And, and, and this lady's advice and what she says, you know, it brings fear because you don't know what the future holds. And so we forget in those moments that our future is held perfectly, completely in glory and a wonderful ends because of what Jesus has done. And the fullness of that, and when we start to ask the question, where is our focus? It's on the past, the present, and the future of what God has done. It can't just be the past. It can't just be something that we kind of, yes, I put my faith in Jesus and now I set it up on the shelf and it has nothing to do with my day to day. And so it's so important that we start to think that way. You know, here we talk a lot of it, at, at CODA uh, about gospel fluency, letting the gospel come to bear on every area of our life and every part. And I want you to think about why that's so important that that is our focus, that we see what God has done, what he's doing, and what he's going to do. That it connects to every part of your life. And when we start to see that, it changes the way that we operate. It changes uh, where our trust is. So often it's like God's taken care of my past and he's, he's forgiven me of my sins and now it's up to me. And so I'm trusting him that he's forgiven me for those things in the past, but I'm taking back the trust and putting it in myself for my present or my future and how that's going to work out. And so we struggle instead of trusting him with each and every piece along the way. And that's what you see with Abraham is that God makes this promise to him and he sees him working and he sees him doing these things. And then when circumstances in his life press in that make it hard for him to rest in God's promises, he continues to do so. He continues to trust God, not just with the past and the present, but with his future, every bit of it along the way. And so I want you just to consider for a moment the same God who spoke to Abraham, who took him outside and said, look up at the stars. Right? Count the stars if you can. So will your descendants be. The same God who spoke to him, the same God who, who took him from this land and, and gave him this incredible inheritance and continued to walk with him. It's the same God that is with us today. The same God that stepped into time and space as Jesus came and lived this perfect life and died the death that we deserve and was gloriously raised again, defeating sin and death once and for all is the God that now dwells in you and with you at all times that's going to finish the thing that he began. And it's not just in your past and it's not just in the future, but is in every bit of who you are. This eternal perspective of past, present, and future, they are all secure in what Jesus has done. And I want you to consider what difference that makes. I remember years ago uh, watching a basketball game. I, I was watching a game on TV. I was watching Texas A&M play Kentucky in basketball. Went to Texas A&M, big Aggie fan. Uh, we had a bunch of stuff going on that afternoon. So I'm, I get into this game. A&M's not even supposed to be in it, but suddenly they're winning. 
and it's the second half and they're ahead and I'm kind of, oh, they might pull this off. And then we have to leave, we have to leave the house. So I set the record and I go, oh, if they win this, they pull this off, I'll come back and watch it later. And I leave the house and we go and we do all our things. I kind of forget about the game. I even forget checking the score or whatever. And the next morning I wake up and I'm reminded, oh yeah, that game, I wanna see what happened. Now, when I left the house, uh, a and was ahead by a couple points, but there was maybe like 10 minutes left. And it was looking like they were probably gonna blow it because they weren't really that good. Their very best player was having a great game and he had like 20 points. And it's why A&M was even in the game to begin with when I left. And so I woke up the next morning and I see the headline that A&M won in overtime. And so I left with like eight minutes left. The guy had 20 points, A&M wins in overtime. And as I looked at the headline, this best player on their team ended up scoring almost 50 points. I think it was like 47 points or something. And A&M won. And I thought, he scored 47 points in the last 10 minutes and they won the game. I gotta watch this. And so I go to my recorder on the TV and I turn it on and I go back and I watch it. And it was great. I loved watching it. Because every time they got behind or every time something bad started to happen, I kept going, he's still gotta score 20 more points and I know they're gonna win. And it was this total change. Maybe you've watched live sporting events where it's somebody that you really want to win and the, the anxiety and you're, you're dying, living and dying with every shot. I watched this game and wasn't worried about any of it because I knew they were gonna win. And I knew the best player was gonna score 47 points and I knew he was gonna score it almost every time down the stretch because of, he had to get to that point total. And see, the truth is when we understand what Christ has done for us in the past, that our future is secure, the glorious future that we have in him, it comes to bear on our present right now. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. There is nothing that will keep us from the fullness of glory that is to come that Jesus has purchased for us in the past. There's nothing in our present that we're dealing with that God's not gonna use ultimately for our good and his glory. And so when we have that perspective of seeing the past, the present, and the future of what God has done for us in Jesus, it radically transforms the way we experience what we're going through right now. And so the first thing when we think about growing in our faith is where is our focus? Do we have that eternal perspective, the fullness of what God has done? But then the second thing I want you to consider is when we do struggle with unbelief, we struggle with hard times, we struggle with circumstances, what is our uh, kind of mode of operation? Our modus operandi, maybe you've heard that before. They use that in the military term a lot. What is your mode of operation, the way that you go through it? Now, there's no ultimate manual of this is exactly what you do step to step when you struggle or you have times but they're, that are hard, but there's some really important things that Paul says here in Romans chapter four that help us, that help us understand uh, how to deal with what comes at us. And so here in uh, Romans chapter four, it tells us that Abraham was wrestling with unbelief and struggling in these hard times. And remember, this is a man who's 100 years old. 25 years prior, God had promised that he would have a son. He still does not have the son yet. His wife is barren. She is an old lady. And he's wrestling with all of this. And he's seeing the, the reality of his life but yet he continues to entrust God to himself to God and he continues to grow in his faith. And so I want us to consider how that happens. And, and there's three things here I want us to think about. One that we kind of need to lay down, maybe one that we need to, to get rid of or, or lay aside, one that we need to stop, and then two things that we need to pick up. And so look at verse 19 with me. Or actually go back to verse 18. It says, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. And he did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, <clears throat> which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. And so here he is seeing this very real circumstances that can easily overcloud and overtake uh, him and, and cause him to doubt, to, to operate in unbelief. And that's a very real struggle for all of us when circumstances press in. And so the first thing I want us to see that Abraham doesn't do, and it's a good reminder for us to, to lay this down, is don't let the circumstances in your life 
which lead you to be emotional, to overwhelm with feelings towards what's happening to you in the mo moment, and then we often operate off of our emotions. Circumstances lead to certain emotions, which we then lead that way. And so often we feel overwhelmed, the emotions of, of what's happening and what's going on, and it's easy to be overwhelmed in those. And so what happens is we often operate off of our feelings in the moment. But the problem is our heart is deceitful above all things. It's easy for us to fall back into lies. It's easy for us to be manipulated by how we feel about things in the moment rather than what God has clearly told us and promised to us. And so when we start to slip into that, we need to lay down, we need to be reminded that we're not to, to operate off of our emotions in the moment based on the circumstances. And this is something that we all struggle with. You know, as a believer, the Bible tells us we become a new creation, that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells with us and in us and lives with us and he never forsakes us or leaves us and all those things. But yet there is a battle with our flesh, the way in which we used to operate, the way in which uh, we're bombarded by the things of the world, things that are opposed to the Spirit, but we feel them so deeply, it's easy for us to, to struggle with that. And so I want us just to consider that for just a second, that we need to lay down those feelings. And this is hard. And it's hard because in our culture, we're bombarded with the opposite. We're often encouraged that our feelings are our, our true selves. And that's the way that we're to operate. And oftentimes it's like, I feel this so deeply but we need to stop and lay those aside for a moment. It tells us that Abraham looked at those things and there was the, the uh, temptation to be overwhelmed with his circumstances and what he's seeing, but he didn't, he wasn't overtaken by those. He continued to trust God. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. And so the first thing I would just encourage you is when you're struggling in your life, when doubt arises, when those things flood in, to stop and survey uh, what's happening. And how much am I operating off of my emotions based on the circumstances of what's happening? And I lay aside operating out of my feeling. But then the second and third thing, and I'm going to put those together. When that happens, what we need to do is look at the emotions and our feelings and the beliefs that are underneath those, right? That's why I liked what this pediatrician said about sending your kids back to school. When she was saying, you're, you're basically trying to control things that you don't have control over. Your emotions, your fear over what might happen are because you're trying to control outcomes that you have no control over. She's starting to get at the, the beliefs underneath the feelings. And so when we start to think about how do we grow in our faith, I would say it this way, we take captive our thoughts and then we reason and we think while holding it up to God's word. Take captive those thoughts, right? Start to see where our emotions are connected to what we're actually believing and then hold those up to what God's word says. And so I want you to think about that for just a second. So look at what he says here, verse 20 and 21. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able <clears throat> to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And I want you to think about that. Fully convinced means that he was persuaded, that he was certain by thinking and reasoning and looking at the information he had and taking it and holding it up to what God had said. And he became fully convinced. So how does that happen? What does that look like? What is the process of how we get there? Well, we don't rely on our emotions based on the circumstances. We, we set that aside for a moment. We start to look at the beliefs that are underneath the emotions. And then we take captive those thoughts. Now, here's what I want you to consider how you do that. Think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You can turn there with me if you want. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. But I'm going to read it to you if you just want to listen and follow along here. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, 
but, ha but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so listen to what Paul's saying. He's saying there's a battle that wages. We are now a new creation. The Spirit is in us. God is teaching and showing and walking with us, but our flesh is waging against it. Our emotions and feelings based on what we're bombarded with and the things that we're seeing. And we will have real emotions that bubble up and come up against the things that God tell us. But he says, as we're waging war, notice what he says. He says, there's this battle between the flesh. And he says, there's, there's strongholds that happen in our life. You see that in, in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. There's a warfare, or not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. The strongholds are the lies that we believe in our life, often based on circumstances, often based on what we're bombarded with. Uh, some of that is just the worldviews that are surrounding us that come up against us. Maybe it's a, a materialism, the idea that everything will be okay if I just have the right stuff. I just need more things. Or maybe it's a hedonism. I'm struggling right now with unbelief, and so the answer is just do everything I can to try to make myself happy. Just indulge in everything that I like and love, and that, that's what will bring me joy. And so sometimes it's worldviews, competing worldviews that we're bombarded with. Sometimes it's uh, personal attitudes that we're dealing with, either fear or guilt or insecurity or those things that start to kind of crowd in, and we can't get past it, and we're always anxious but what he says is that there is divine power to destroy these strongholds. And I think what Paul's talking about is, is the Holy Spirit at work in and with us and through us. And as we think about how we operate, he says we take captive every thought to obey Christ and that we have this divine power to destroy these strongholds. So think about what that looks like and how that works. As those things come into our life and we're wrestling and struggling with them, we take captive those thoughts. We bring them before God and what he has told us in his word. And the spirit moves and shows us what is true about who we are in Christ and who God is and what he's done for us and what it means for us. And we take those thoughts captive and God shows us the truth. And he begins to teach us and to remind us and to point us to what is true of us in Jesus. And he destroys those strongholds. He destroys the lies that we're believing that's leading us to all these negative emotions. But in order to get past that, we can't operate just on those emotions. We have to get to the beliefs underneath those emotions, allowing the Spirit to teach us and guide us through God's Word so that we would see the truth. It's what Paul talks about in, in Romans chapter 12, which we'll get to later as we continue to work our way through Romans. But he says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so when you read here that Abraham, in, in, in the face of all these things that he could have been overwhelmed with, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And so we take captive those thoughts and we begin to take them before God's word and we reason and we think through and we let God's word speak. And the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that's always in perfect accord with God's word destroys those lies. And it reminds us of who we are in Jesus. And this leads me to the last part. What is the key in that? If our focus is seeing the past, present, future work of, of Jesus and how it touches every part of our life, we don't operate in our emotions, but we begin to take those thoughts captive and hold them up to God's word. And the spirit begins to show and teach us what is the key in every bit of that. And the answer I think he gives us in, in verse 16 Look at what he says in verse 16. This is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Or then if you skip down to verse, let's say, uh, 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. This is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. 
But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What's he saying? Remember, it's counted to us as righteousness based on what Jesus has done. And that's what he says there in verse 16. It depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. And so the key to all of this, as we look at the past, present, future, we see the fullness of what God has done as it comes to bear on our life. And we take captive those, those feelings and those emotions and we get to what's underneath them and we hold them up to God's word. Every bit of it, the key must see that it's by grace through faith that we're saved, that it's all God's doing every bit of the way. Faith accords with grace. To accept grace and to grow in it, we have to put our trust in what God has done, which we talked about last week. Saving faith is transferring my, my trust from myself to who God is and what he's done. And that is the only way this works. Grace has to be the key. Grace is us not getting what we deserve. And so when we go through all of these steps and we're holding it up, to what God's word says and who we are in him, there'll be this temptation to go look at what uh, I've figured out and look at what I've done and I'm pretty smart and I took all this and I did the steps and I did it the right way. But if we go through all of that, what the spirit is gonna do and show us and the strongholds that he's gonna destroy is this thinking that it's all about us and what we do. And God's gonna continue to remind us it is by my grace that you are saved. You are completely secure, your past, your present, and your future, not because of your good works, but because of what I have done for you. And it's there and only there that we're going to grow in faith. It's there and only there that we're going to continue to transfer more fully our, our, our trust into what God has done rather than what we have done, which is what Paul's been saying all the way through Romans. It's all what Christ has done. And so the truth is every single one of us will struggle at different times. There will be moments, oftentimes daily, where unbelief comes up. And we take those thoughts captive and we continue to turn them back of who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus. And we rest in the good news that it is by grace through faith that is counted to us as righteousness and it all rests on Jesus. It is him and him alone. So let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the glorious good news that you and you alone are the one that saves. That it is completely and totally by grace through faith. Would you continue to help us to transfer our trust completely and totally to who you are and what you've done, that we would rest on your grace in every area of our life. I pray that when there's attacks that come upon us, when the circumstances seem to overwhelm us, that we would stop that would seek you, that we would re be reminded of your wonderful and great promises and how all those things are held together in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.